Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. This is the Portland City Council. We're in council chambers. We're also on Zoom. So I want to welcome everybody who's with us here this evening in person, as well as people who have joined us um, remotely this evening. Um, and so I'll call this meeting to order. And I will welcome you all to join me uh, first in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And will the clerk please call the roll? Councilor Fournier? Here. Councilor Rodriguez is absent. Councilor Dion? Here. Councilor Ali? Hold on. Uh, Councilor, I thought maybe he was with us on Zoom. Oh. Okay. Councilor Zaro? Here. Councilor Trevorrow? Here. Councilor Pelletier? Here. Councilor Phillips? Here. Mayor Snyder? Here. Um, our first order of business this evening is the five o'clock public comment period on items that are not on tonight's agenda. So if you'd like to address this council this evening on something that will not be heard later on in the agenda, please go ahead and raise your hand. Um, and whether you're here in chambers, you can come stand at the podium, um, raise your hand on Zoom. I'm just gonna um, remind folks of our council rules um, uh, because I think it's important to do so from time to time. So um, anybody who would like to address the council during these um, uh, comment periods, whether it's unagended or, or in response to an item on the council's agenda, please give us your first and last name and the city, your city of residence or your Portland district, or the organization that you represent. I'd also like to remind people that um, it is my opportunity to cut off any commentary that's not germane, that is abusive or disrespectful. We don't tolerate clapping, cheering, jeering, or booing. Um, so again, we welcome your comment. We wanna hear what's on your mind. Um, if there's not something on tonight's agenda that's specific to what you're thinking about with regard to your municipal government, happy to hear from you. Um, otherwise, we've got lots on the agenda tonight. Happy to hear from you during those times as well. Um, and we will start here in chamber. So come, on, come ahead and then I'll head over to Zoom and I'll go back and forth as needed. Great. Hello, uh, I'm Matt Walker. Uh, I live in district two up by Longfellow Square. Um, and uh, hey, Matt, you if you're going to speak to the nomination, it is on tonight's agenda. Not, I'm not talking about that. OK, sorry. Thank you, though. Good eye. Uh, so uh, uh, sometimes I stumble through what's the right committee or like what what's the first reading or second reading. So this might be like a um, a finance committee thing. But since you're all here now, I think a good time to say it is right now. So I'll do it. Um, I want to offer support for the. Uh, and give thanks to the city for the budget item that's <clears throat> related to the additional staff for permitting and inspections. Um, I dig into the rental registration stuff a lot, and I have noticed that there is some struggles in permitting inspections and HSO to deal with the volume of uh, new tasks that they have to do in addition to their old tasks. So uh, I really think that this particular budget line item on the thing is really important. So. Uh, I want to give my support for that, say thanks that it's on there, and then uh, hope that you will all support this as well. And I don't know if I'm allowed to, but I hope I am. I want to acknowledge the HSO manager, um, Mr. Lenhart, who is particularly responsive to my frequent requests for information to the office. Uh, he is really good about getting back to me and uh, responding to what I'm asking, so I think that's great. And if he ends up being the manager of the new staff person, I'm sure he'll be a good boss. And I think it's gonna be uh, very helpful for the efficiency uh, and for the capacity of the office. Uh, and one last thing to note, um, I do think that the rental registration stuff might deserve new software at some point. I don't think it needs to be complicated. I don't think it's, I mean, nothing's confidential here. It's all public records. So I even think like a simple, some CSV files, CSV files, and a little uh, and a little Python scripting could probably do it. You could probably ask some students at uh, the computer science programs at USM to put together something as a capstone project, and it might be a cool little project for the city and the students. Um, so just put that out there. Anyway, uh, really, I'm here just to say I support this budget line item for the HS for the permitting inspections and this extra staff members, and I hope you all do too. Great, thanks. 
Thanks for your comment, Matt. Next, we'll head over to Zoom where I've got a hand up from George Rowe. Uh, George Rowe, Hanover Street. Um, so uh, the Historic Preservation Board has on its agenda this week um, a big project in Evergreen Cemetery. It's a major expansion uh, for new burial plots. And undergirding that is this idea that the city of Portland wants to um, be able to allow families and, and others who do not already have a burial plot there to have one in the future. And it was a little strange that this is a big project. It's gonna cost a fair amount of money and it's also gonna increase the maintenance of the cemetery over time. That to my knowledge, this is not something that our finance committee or any committee of the city council has really dug into and examined closely and uh, giving, given its blessing conceptually and financially to this endeavor, which is again uh, going to take a lot of time and effort and uh, has already taken a, quite a bit of staff time. And it's just a, a great example of how our city council basically is almost irrelevant to so many projects in the city. Um, they get ginned up by staff behind the scenes and they get very, very far along. And then the city council finally gets them at some point well down the road and then is completely scared about upsetting the apple cart at that point. And what it does is this is why our, our tax bills are going up and up and up all the time is there's no control democratically rather at the beginning of these projects so that we have some idea of what we're trying to accomplish, why we're accomplishing it, whether it's a good idea to accomplish it and what the guidelines and sort of guardrails are to get what we want without, you know, uh, burning a hole through our pockets. So I don't understand why you guys can't see the future when it's all over various agendas uh, of, of various departments. But it needs to happen because this is exactly where things get out of control. And I don't understand why you're not, I mean, as politicians, you avoid doing as much work as possible just because there's only so many hours in the day. But 30 second warning. This is the problem with our city is that projects get really far down the road and the bill uh, is always coming due. Uh, without anyone realizing what the implications are until it's too late. I really wish you would dig into these things and ask staff to come to you first, or at least at the same time that they're coming to, to uh, round up details about these projects before they're locked and loaded. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Anybody else in chambers who would like to step forward? Okay, I don't see anybody, so I'll head back to Zoom where we have a hand up from uh, Vivienda Apoyo. Hello, I'm Vivienda Apoyo, um, 231 State Street, um, talking on behalf of the tenant unit. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the city council. We would uh, want to start by saying that Portland is simply the best. Um, Many ways, uh, it's true that uh, Maine is the way life should be, and our uh, little city is a shining example of that. Um, as citizens of the city, one of the points of pride is the range of community supporting governance that has been enacted by the city, or the examples of these efforts is the rim stabilization ordinance. The RSO um, acts as a defense against successive rent increases across the city's rental housing. It helps preserve the ability for people who work in Portland to live in Portland. Yeah, RSO does this by limiting the methods and amounts of increases for rents and covered units. And in November of 2021, the 25-unit historic apartment building we live in changed ownership and the new landlord included a term in the new leases that stated, quote, landlord may charge additional fees for storage and common area maintenance after serving 30-day notice of change of policy. In March, the tenants of my building received the notice of the change of policy stating that our included storage was changing to optional and that we would be assessed an additional $100 monthly fee if we choose to keep it. We filed a complaint with the Housing Safety Office, the HSO, as a tenant unit because this additional $100 is rent being demanded for stores as inclusion or rental units under the definitions of the RSO. 
unfortunately has outlined in an email to us from the Office of the Corporation Counsel, the HSO has refused to apply the RSO to our complaint and has demonstrated a dramatic misunderstanding of the RSO in the process. The HSO maintains that the covered unit doesn't include storage currently used by the tenant. However, the RSO explicitly defines a rental unit as including storage held out for use by the tenant. Likewise, the HSO maintains that the rent does not include fees charged for storage by the landlord. However, the RSO explicitly defines rent to include any monies rendered to the landlord for any housing service. Finally, the HSO maintains that changes to the lease fall outside of the scope of the RSO. However, the RSO explicitly rules out any waiver of its rights in rental agreements and calls out the attempt to induce the waiver as being itself a violation of RSO. The definitions of the RSO are clear, but they are not being used by the HSO. Consequently, our rights under the, HS are under the RSO to an investigation of our complaint and appropriate action had been perverted and denied. We are attempting to have this redressed by the city. However, our concerns have not yet been addressed. We again ask the mayor, the city council, and the city manager to look into this matter. We can be reached for comment at Portland Maine Renters Rights at gmail.com. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you very much for your comment. Other public comment from chambers or on Zoom? I see no additional hands up, so I'm going to close public comment on unagended items, and I'd like to move us into the next section of our agenda, which is announcements. I'm, I'm keeping an eye out for Councillor Ali, but I don't see him. He may be coming. Mm -hmm. Are there any announcements from my colleagues on the Council? I'm going to take an opportunity here to... Um, with no script in front of me, acknowledge uh, a week late how difficult last week's public comment period was. And sometimes when I'm up here, I do my best to run a meeting, but when these things come at us, it can just hit. And over the past week or so, I've been thinking about, why didn't I say something? And it's because it's hard to, and I'm trying to run this meeting and I wanna get through it so that we can take up the business that we have to take up. But I feel like I have to say something tonight, which is what's been on my mind is how wrong it is to have hate come into this chamber and how upsetting it is for all of us. And for me, as I walk through my days, I think about, I mean, I'm from a big family. My husband's from a big family. That means we have, we have big family. We've got nieces and nephews and in-laws and, and, and in our family, we've got straight and gay and transgender. We've got depression and anxiety and other issues that people deal with. And I have to imagine everybody else does too. And so to think about spreading hate because of who someone is, is so wrong and so upsetting. And so I want to apologize that I'm a week late in doing what Chair Lentz did last week, which is stand up and say, I, I, I can't stand for that. I can't stand for hate in this chamber. I can't, I can't stand for bigotry. And I can't stand for anybody um, kind of terrorizing someone for who they are. So I just wanted to put that out there and acknowledge that I should have said something last week in the moment. And the reason that I didn't is because I get stuck sometimes in trying to be the facilitator. Um, but it sits with me and I care. And an attack on, an attack generally is an, is an attack on people that we all love. So I just wanted to say that because to sit through that and to think that people here on this dais and in the chambers are not personally hurt by horrible things that are said is wrong. Um, because if we look around this table, we see people from all backgrounds and, um, People are good people. So I just wanted to say that, that it tears me apart 
that we get public comment that is so hurtful and may fall under the rights of First Amendment, but serve, they seek to dehumanize people. And to me, that's just not okay. I'll pull it together for the rest of the meeting. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Um, hmm. any other announcements? Okay. We've got some recognitions tonight. Um, the first recognition actually we're gonna delay. We have a recognition of a staff, a staff person, Ryan Gorno, who happens to be on vacation. Um, so we are going to recognize him at our next meeting. And I have the opportunity to ask the clerk to please read into the record the recognition that we have for Kevin Farman, um, Portland's Valentine's Day Bandit. Recognizing Kevin Farman, Portland's Valentine's Day Bandit, uh, sponsored by Kate Snyder, Mayor. I'm gonna stand for this one. And I know that we have members of Kevin's family with us here tonight, so I wanna thank you for being here. This is a um, recognition of Kevin Farman, Portland's Valentine's Day Bandit. It was revealed last week that Kevin Farman of Falmouth had spent decades as Portland's beloved Valentine's Day bandit. Devastatingly, Kevin passed away suddenly a week and a half ago, and his family decided it was time for the community to know that he was the elusive phantom. How bittersweet it was to find out who was the driving force behind this amazing feat each February 14th that we all looked forward to. The Valentine's Day bandit has given so much to the Portland community and his gift of love was anticipated by so many. For decades, he put large red hearts on a variety of small and large locations and landmarks from storefronts to Fort Gorges, City Hall and construction cranes. And he did it all without wanting attention or recognition. Farman touched countless lives, not only as the Valentine's Day bandit, but also as a photographer chronicling life's events like his daughter's love of sailing with Sail Maine. He also taught at Southern Maine Community College and mentored young photographers trying to get a start in the business. We all hope this tradition continues as it would be a wonderful tribute to someone who brought so much love and so much hope to all of us annually. Considering the outpouring of love and support since learning of his passing, we have no doubt that this tradition will continue. To his wife and three adult children, we send our deepest condolences to you and thank you for sharing Kevin's story with us. We hope you take comfort in the fact that he gave so much of himself to his community and reminded us all that we need more love in our lives. Thank you for being here. And I'd love to welcome you to the podium if there's anything that you wanna offer or if anybody on your behalf would like to offer. I didn't prepare anything, so I don't really know what to say here. Um, but I, I do think that um, my mom and I are so grateful. I'm Sierra Farman, by the way, in case you couldn't tell. Um, I, we're so grateful for the outpouring of support and love that we felt this past week. I mean, it's made this all a little bit easier on all of us. And knowing that we've got our entire city behind us um, is really incredible and something that he could not have fathomed. No. Um, he didn't, <laughs> as you said, he didn't do it for the attention. He just did it because he loved Portland. And so much. So much. And he lived here for... 45-ish years and he just wanted to make the town a little bit better and he was a very genuine person and as much as the bandit touched so many people he wasn't just the bandit so I think that's important also to recognize but thank you so much for inviting us here today really we do appreciate it that's all I got <laughs> that's all yeah, I that was about. perfect thank, thank you, you so much thank you so much for being here Okay, so we will move on with our agenda. Again, thank you all for being here. Um, and we'll move into the approval of the minutes from our previous meeting. Is there a motion please to approve the minutes from the April 24th meeting? Move passage. Second. Councillor Zara with a second from Councillor Fournier. Is there any discussion? Okay, we'll go ahead and vote. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. I haven't seen him. Okay. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. The minutes pass uh, 8 0, um, and we'll move on to proclamations. Uh, 
So this one is on me. Will the clerk please read Proc Proclamation 21. Proclamation 21, 22, 23, recognizing the 54th anniversary of Municipal Clerks Week sponsored by Kate Snyder, Mayor. Great. So whereas the office of the municipal clerk, a time-honored and vital part of local government exists throughout the world, and whereas the office of the municipal clerk is the oldest among pub public servants, and whereas the office of the municipal clerk provides the professional link between citizens, local governing bodies, and agencies of government at other levels, and whereas municipal clerks have pledged to be ever mindful of their neutrality and impartiality, rendering equal service to all, and whereas the municipal clerk serves as the information center on functions of local government and community, and whereas municipal clerks continually strive to improve the administration of the affairs of the office of the municipal clerk through participation in education programs, seminars, workshops, and the annual meetings of their state, provincial, county, and international professional organizations, and whereas it is most appropriate that we recognize the accomplishments of the office of the municipal clerk, now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Kate Snyder, Mayor of the City of Portland and members of the City Portland City Council do hereby recognize the week of April 30th through May 6th as Municipal Clerks Week and further extend appreciation to our Municipal Clerk, Ashley Rand, and the City Clerk's Office staff for the vital services they perform and their exemplary dedication to the communities they represent. Signed and sealed this first day of May, 2023. Thank you. Our clerk's office is pretty awesome. <laughs> um, and next, will the clerk please read Proclamation 22. Proclamation 22, 22, 23, declaring May 5th, 2023, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Day, sponsored by April Fournier, Counselor. Counselor Fournier. Thanks so much. Um, this week is the National Week of Action for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Peoples, and this is expanded from just missing and murdered Indigenous women to ensure that our queer, two-spirit, and youth relatives are included. Um, as I read our proclamation, you'll notice that the only numbers we have are for women, uh, and these numbers are just best estimates, uh, because for so long, these cases have not been tracked, data has not been collected, and this epidemic has been invisible. Whereas the city of Portland stands in solidarity with our main tribal, regional, state, and national governments to recognize this epidemic and support a national day of awareness for missing Native American women. And whereas four out of five Native American and Alaska Native women have experienced violence in their lifetime. Whereas as of 2016, there were over 5,700 known incidents of missing and murdered indigenous women. And that is estimated to be only half of all cases nationally due to unreported and misclassified cases. Whereas in 2017, the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention identified homicide as the third leading cause of death for Native American women and girls between the ages of one to 44. And whereas just while just 0.2% of the population of the city of Portland and 0.7% of the population of Maine are Native American or Alaska Native, Native American women and girls are murdered or go missing at a higher rate than any other ethnic group in the United States. And whereas the disappearances and murders of Native American women and girls directly correlate to the issues of domestic violence, sexual assault, or human trafficking. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of Portland and member, <laughs> members of the City Council do hereby declare May 5th, 2023, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Day, signed and sealed this fifth day of May, 2023. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fournier. Next, we'll move into the licenses portion of our agenda. We've got several before us this evening, so we'll start in on that. Will the clerk please read Order 189? Order 189, 22, 23, granting municipal officers approval of Maine ballroom dancing. Application is for indoor entertainment located at 616 Congress Street, sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Uh, thank you. Is there any public comment on Order 189? I'm, I'm Deb Quintera. I'm actually the owner of Maine ballroom dance. And I hope y'all say yes. <laughs> Thank you for we being here. dancing there. That's fantastic. Thank you for being here. If we have any questions, we know you're right, right there for us. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to see if there's any other public comment. I just don't see any. I'll close public comment on Order 189 and look to the council for a motion, please. Move passage. Second. Councilor Zaro with a second from Councilor Rodriguez. Any questions from the council? 
Nope, we'll go ahead and vote to approve the order. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Ali is absent. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Mm -hmm. Order 189 passes unanimously. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. you for being here and thank you for doing business in the city of Portland. Thank you. Maybe we can all do ballroom dancing lessons sometime. <laughs> That'd be fun. <laughs> Will the clerk please read order 190. Order 190, 22, 23, granting municipal officers approval of the Great Loss Fair. Application is for class one food service establishment located at 540 Forest Ave, sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Thank you. Is there any public comment on order 190? Thank you for being here. Um, seeing none, I'll close public comment and I'll ask for a motion, please. So move. Second. Councilor Rodriguez with a second from Councilor Zaro. Any questions from the council? And we'll go ahead and vote. Councilor Bornier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Chabarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 190 passes unanimously. Thank you for being here. Thank you for doing business in the city of Portland. Okie doke. Um, order 191, please. Order 191, 22, 23, granting municipal officers approval of Cherished Pub. Application is for a class one food service establishment located or with outdoor dine dining on private property and combined entertainment located at 64 Auburn Street, sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Any public comment? Thank you. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. I don't see any hands up on Zoom, so I'll close public comment and I will come back to the council for a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Councilor Rodriguez with a second from Councilor Fournier. Questions on that order? Councilor Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't have a question um, as much as I, I just want to, um, I'm a neighbor, so I live a few blocks behind. And, um, and I've seen the different iterations that that um, building has had from Paris Farmers Union. Um, as a matter of fact, well, unnecessary comment, but we used to have chickens in our backyard. So I used to go there and buy the feed and we got our actually first chickens came from there. But, you know, since then, you know, you have taken over that space. Um, and what I really wanted to chime in on, you know, Councilor Dion is the district uh, rep for District 5 where, where you're located. And he and I would meet, uh, I live in District 5, he and I would meet uh, to grab coffee and talk about things um, over time. And we'd always have to go out of the way. We'd go over, actually, we went and had breakfast once at the Bayou Kitchen over in Stevens. And here they are about to open up a breakfast spot right down the street from us. This is exactly what Allen's Corner and our neighborhood has been asking for. I cannot wait to walk over and spend my money in your establishment. <laughs> you, he said to help him out. That's what I'm. And so I, I just want to say that you're going to pick up the tab, counselor. You know what? I'll have I'll happily pay for this one. And and so as I like to say at least once in these uh, iterations of licenses, I wish you nothing but success and thank you for doing business in the city of Portland. There we go. You've done it. You've done my job. I appreciate it. Any other comment from O Councillor Phillips? I just want to say that, you know, the Bayou Kitchen is in, is in District 3, so, um, and that's still an awesome establishment, so I hope that you will continue and maybe go back and forth between 3 and 5. I'll fight you on it, Mark. Oh, boy, here we go, Councilor Rodriguez. Just, but just to clarify, so Bayou Kitchen is going to be running the breakfast spot right here, which is why I named it. So now I can still frequent my favorite breakfast spot to hang out with Councillor Dion, but be able to walk there from my house. Thank you. Everybody keep track of that. <laughs> okay, that's the most fun we're gonna have tonight. <laughs> um, I've got a motion, I've got a second. Is there any more discussion? Uh, we'll go ahead and vote to approve order 191. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Uh, that passes unanimously. Thank you for doing business in the city of Portland. <laughs> I, 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 I can't imagine he would be disappointed with, with anything. 
Um, okay, will the clerk please read order 192? Order 192, 22, 23, granting municipal officers approval of hot liquor tank. Application is for class 11 restaurant lounge with outdoor dining on public property located at 43 Wharf Street, sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Is there any public comment on order 192? Okie doke. Great, well, thank you for showing up and being here in person. We always appreciate that. Um, any other public comment on 192? I don't see any on Zoom. So we will, I will come back to the council for a motion, please. So we'll move. Second, Councilor Rodriguez with a second from Councilor Fournier. Any discussion? I don't see any, we'll go ahead and vote to approve that order. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trabarro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 192 passes, and thank you for doing business in the city of Portland. Thanks for being here. Boy, we're almost through our licenses, and Chambers is really clearing out. Can the clerk please read order 193? Order 193, 22, 23, granting municipal officers approval of Taco A Go Go. Application is for class one food service establishment with outdoor dining on private property located at Zero Canal Plaza, sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Thank you. Any public comment? Just Kevin Doyle representing the uh, ownership group. That's all. Thank you so Thank much. You for your time, everybody. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. If there's any questions, we know where to go. Any other public comment on order 193? I don't see any, so I'll close public comment and I'll come back. Did, did you have a hand up? Oh. Good. Um, Because you can count, talk during council time. <laughs> Is there a motion, please? So moved. Second. Councilor Rodriguez with a second from Councilor Zaro. Any council discussion? Okie doke. We'll go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Uh, order 193 passes unanimously. Thank you for being here thank and you. thank you for doing business in the city of Portland. Boy, I got to say, this is like a fantastic thing of being back in person. And even though we've been here for a while, like we just didn't get this on Zoom. So this is great. Um, last uh, item under licenses tonight, will the clerk please read order 194. Order 194, 22, 23, granting municipal officers approval of uh, Novell. Application is for a class A lounge with outdoor dining on private property and indoor entertainment located at 643 Congress Street, sponsored by Daniel West, interim city manager. Thank you. Is there any public comment on order 194? Seeing none, I'll close public comment, come back to the council for a motion. Move passage. <laughs> second. Councilor Zaro with a second from Councilor Rodriguez. Any questions or comments from the council? Councilor Pelletier. Thank you. I'm just gonna flex too, because everyone was flexing their district. So this is in district <laughs> two. This is a book bar. I'm really excited. I love to read. You can read and drink wine. Um, so I cannot wait as the district councilor for uh, this amazing new establishment. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. All righty, uh, we are ready to go ahead and vote to approve that order. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 194 passes uh, unanimously of those present, and we do thank um, the owners of, is it Novel or Novel? The novel. Novel. Makes sense. Book bar. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you for doing business in the city of Portland. You said novel. I read novel. I bet it's novel. It's, <laughs> it's a novel idea. All right. <laughs> Moving on. Okie dokie. So we are now finished with licenses and we will move into budget items. So here's the deal. I'm just going to lay the, the groundwork here. We have a series of first reads in front of us tonight having to do with the Portland Public Schools FY24 budget. We also have a couple of things within our packet that um, actually don't require a first read, but we're gonna postpone orders 200 and 201 in order to vote on the whole packet at our next meeting on uh, May 15th. Um, so I'll look for that uh, a little bit later um, when we, when we uh, start moving through this. We're gonna have a public hearing on the school budget tonight. 
We're also gonna have a public hearing on the school budget on May 15th. Um, we do ask people to speak at one or the other. Um, so that's pretty standard. Um, we've been getting and emails. We're happy to hear from people tonight in chambers or on Zoom. We're also happy to hear from folks on the 15th of May. So that's that's where we are tonight. Um, I'm sure most people know this, but the referendum on the school budget will be held on June 13th. So get out and vote, put that on your calendar. And at this point, what we'll do is we will commence the public hearing. Um, uh, actually, no. Would you mind reading the orders into the um, into the record, and again, I'm just flagging this for my colleagues, two orders, 200 and 201, will actually look to postpone. We can do that after the public hearing. All right, order 195, 22, 23, approving state, local EPS funding allocation for, uh, for public education from kindergarten to grade 12 for Portland Public Schools for fiscal year 2024, sponsored by the Finance Committee. Order 196, 22, 23, approving non-state funded school uh, construction debt service for Portland schools for fiscal year 2024, sponsored by the Finance Committee. Order 197, 22, 23, order raising and appropriating additional local funds for Portland schools for fiscal year 2024, sponsored by the Finance Committee. Order 198, 22, 23, approving total school operating budget for Portland schools for fiscal year 2024 sponsored by the finance committee and order 199 22 23 appropriating and raising funds for adult education for fiscal year 2024 as required by the main uh, revised statutes title 20-a subsection 8603-a1 sponsored by the finance committee do you want to read 200 and 200 yes one? and order 200 22 23 to raise and appropriate local funds for food service in the Portland Public Schools for fiscal year 2024, sponsored by the Finance Committee, and Order 201 23 order authorizing the disposition of any additional state subsidy received for Portland schools for fiscal year 2024, sponsored by the Finance Committee. Great. Thank you. So with that, we will begin the public hearing. If you'd like to address the council here in chambers, just step forward to the podium. And if you'd like to talk to us on Zoom, go ahead and raise your hand, but we'll start here in chambers. Good evening, uh, Brad Hanscom, District 5 or Ward 5, um, Heather Road in Portland. Um, over the next two weeks, I know that this body will evaluate the uh, school budget. And I'm grateful that we're here this year because if Charter Commission question five had passed, then we might not be. Um, given the fiscal issues that the school district has faced in the last year, uh, it's a relief that this process continues and I'm here standing here tonight in front of you. Um, some school board members, some who are still sitting, um, spurned overtures from this body for assistance last year with school district finances, um, said that that was political. And um, I think that any process that adds transparency to any budgeting uh, issue, especially when so witty as this, um, is a good thing. So thank you for, I'm glad to be here tonight. Um, I am concerned about the school budget. Um, every spring, the, or just about every spring, the uh, uh, tax rate tends to go up with one exception, and then that would be fiscal year 21. Um, this year, it's roughly a 6% increase. Um, and those have varied between 2.7% and 5% roughly since 2017 with that one year exception. Um, <clears throat> there is a proposed funding cliff. We know that what's coming next year, I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, but the continued reliance on property taxes and property tax increases is just not sustainable. So I speak out tonight with concern about the proposed increase. Um, I'm also um, having spent a, a decent amount of time reading the um, materials that the school board proposed and some of the articles in the newspaper um, concerned, or at least want to call attention to some of the language that's been used. I, I didn't count them, but the, the number of times that the word investment has been used is uh, striking to me. I would not call them investments. I would call them spending increases. That's really what it is. Um, I've heard the word um, promise used a number of times as in Portland promise. That's the sort of banner under which the budget is forwarded. Um, equity, a central tenant in the school district um, budget and their operations. Um, but I think it's time to get down to some, some cold hard numbers. Um, so I'd ask that this council take a hard look at the budget 
in the coming weeks. There are two weeks left. Thirty second warning. Um, a couple of a couple of uh, things to remember: our um, student enrollment has remained flat over the last few years, despite an influx of, of new Mainers and uh, folks from out of state. Um, the budget has grown by thirty million dollars over six years. Uh, state funding has grown more than it has shrunk since 2018. Um, there are a couple of items that, um, just by way of example, I won't have time to cover them all, but will we, can we get, what, what will happen if pre-K transportation is not included in the budget? What will happen if, for example, a Wabanaki studies coordinator is not included in the budget? I'd ask this council to take a, a hard look at those numbers uh, if they you. want my support on through 13, thank you. Thank you for your comment. And then we'll head over to Zoom where we have a hand up from Sylvia. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, yes, I am speaking uh, to express my concerns and recommendations for the uh, proposed uh, Portland school budget. In the midst of recovering from the traumatic effects of the COVID pandemic, and stressors of managing the influx of refugee and asylum seekers, Portland City Schools need, now more than ever, more dedicated financial support from the city's finance committee and council. I propose at least a million dollar increase in the school's budget. I am speaking as a board certified psychiatrist, a board certified public health physician, a mother of a second grader at Longfellow Elementary School, um, I live in Portland, and a community member of, of Portland. In my professional experience, I've been witnessing the traumatic after effects of the COVID pandemic, especially among our youth that often go under or under not recognized at all, as many of us are trying to find our new normal after the pandemic started. Data from a PowerPoint presentation by Greg Marley a social worker and the clinical director of the National Alliance of Mental Illness in Maine, shows that since the pandemic, depression and anxiety rates have increased, substance use is up across the board, those already struggling have exacerbated anxiety, for those living in unsupported situations is particularly hard, and in the past decade, there has been a significant increase in suicidal ideation among Maine high school students. And there's been a significant increase in depression among Maine high school students in the last 10 years, mostly driven by female students. The worsening mental health of our youth locally and nationally has been called a crisis. It is not surprising, therefore, that students' behaviors in school have been more problematic um, there have been more class disruptions and behavior problems, and teachers are also dealing with worse academic performance of their students. According to the Press Herald, uh, Maine fourth grade math scores hit their lowest level since 2003, and eighth grade math scores dropped to their lowest point since 1992. Although no state was spared the academic impact of the pandemic, Maine student test scores took some of the most significant plunges compared with other states. Reading scores. Warning. So on top of this, Portland schools have welcomed many students from families who are refugees and asylum speakers. Um, this year, Portland City has received 756 new people, many families from Angola, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Haiti. Um, Longfellow, we've welcomed at least 10 refugee families this year, yet we are on track to lose two more teachers next year to the budget cuts. We cannot afford to lose more teachers. Now is the time to raise the school budget um, so that our class sizes do not become larger, so that our teachers have enough support um, for, to help children with their academic and social losses from the pandemic and the new uh, refugee and asylum families. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Additional comments here in chambers. Stephen Sharp of Bracket Street. Um, I'm uh, disappointed that Councilor Diane is not here to hear my comments. But uh, first one to say is that there are no budget cuts in this budget, the school bu department budget. So her comment at the end that uh, re referencing budget cuts is completely incorrect. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I have um, identified at least $3.8 million in new spending by the school department in those quote unquote investments. 
Um, and yeah, so the school department can say inflation is the uh, driving factor, but it's not because it's, uh, it is the quote investments that are driving their increase uh, in the budget. Um, I'm not gonna go into the four categories. They are in the back of the budget material. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about some pieces in the agenda packages. It, um, it references a school budget of $136 million when the school budget is really $143 million. That's $7 million in budget that is not listed. In, and it's because the, the way the state operates and wants us to vote on our budget, we don't even vote on $7 million of our school budget. But, but our agenda package specifies that lower amount to make it seem like it's a lower amount. And that concerns me. Um, I do want to know in order 200, it specifies specifically that the order raises and appropriates zero dollars. What would be the point of an order that raises zero dollars? Uh, that's a food service. Um, so I believe that is incorrect. If you look at the order before that for adult education, it references the total amount it's appropriated and the amount that is um, um, on the tax rate, which in the case of the food service is zero dollars, but there is there that order is incorrect, I believe, in terms of um, that it um, ref doesn't reference the total amount for the food service. Um, and then lastly, I am completely opposed to, and you should also all be opposed to order 201, which authorizes the automatic uh, ability for the school department to manage the disposition of any additional state subsidy. Uh, that should be in your control and your control only up until um, you decide what's gonna happen there. And so um, I would uh, uh, recommend, highly recommend that you do not pass that order and allow um, that to happen when and if uh, there is additional funds. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Any other public comment on the proposed FY24 school budget? Go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Samuel Rich. I live at 90 Woodford Street in District 3. Um, I just want to let you know that as a homeowner and a taxpayer and a parent of two public school students, um, I enthusiastically support this budget um, proposed by our co-interim superintendents. Um, the school system is excellent here, and that's why my wife and I moved to Portland. Um, our children are having an amazing experience um, as part of the Ocean Ave community, and I feel um, obliged to support our educators as generously as they have supported us, especially through the pandemic. Um, this budget is exactly what I want my tax dollars spent on. Thank you for your comment. And we have a hand up on Zoom, Christian Mill Neal. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. Um, I would also like to express my support for uh, school spending. I think it's one of the best investments our city can make. Um, and I, again, will urge the city council to actually invest even more in our, in our schools. I think it's particularly uh, important frontline support uh, for especially for asylum seeking families who are arriving here um, and we expect many more of them to arrive here in the year to come uh, and I want to make sure that the school system is well prepared and well equipped um, to welcome those families uh, into our city. Um, tangentially related, uh, I emailed you some public comments. Um, you know, I know you've heard, gotten some pushback from and concerns about the property taxes going up uh, from the school and for, for other parts of the school budget. Um, so, you know, related to this, you know, I fully support paying higher taxes for, for a better school system. Um, but I, I do think it's a legitimate concern that the tax burden has gone up on, especially on residents and, and renters in particular, uh, with the revaluation that happened a couple of years ago. Um, so as I expressed in my written email, I just would encourage the council to uh, encourage finance uh, staff to look into broad-based tax relief for homeowners and shifting more of the tax burden to commercial property owners who've got huge tax breaks in the, in the last few years, both from the federal government uh, and from the revaluation. Um, so I think there's a way to both increase school funding and also provide uh, taxpayers, the, the taxpayers who actually live, live here some, uh, some relief. Thanks very much for your service. Thank you for your comment. 
Any other, any other public comment tonight? Okay. I am, oh, we do. We've got somebody on, um, on Zoom and I'm gonna just not pronounce your, correct, your name correctly, um, uh, but it's an Irish name and I bet it's beautiful. So maybe you could tell it to us. Your last name is Nugent. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. Um, my name is Aoife Nugent. I live at 56 Moody Street, Portland. I have a second grader at the East End Community School and a four-year-old heading into the pre-K. Um, at East End. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the council members for all you do for the city and your tireless work within this budget season. I honestly do not envy any of you and appreciate everything you've done for us. Um, but we all know that good, free public education is fundamental to a thriving community. Um, and frankly, it shocks me and saddens me to hear voices complaining about property taxes. As a solidly middle income family, um, we are property owners, very proud to be living in Portland uh, and are always happy to have our taxes raised to provide for the community as a whole. Um, and when we talk about investments and promise, we're talking about the future of our children and a better future future for all. And specific to the point about no pre-K transportation, that is speaking to specific needs of families who do not have easy access to transportation. That can mean the difference between the ability to get to work and the not the inability to work. Um, and there are so many other things I could say, but I just want to say thank you all for allowing us to be part of this process. Um, and thank you for your help. Thank you for your comment. Other comments? I'm gonna close this public hearing on the school budget. We will hear comments again two weeks from now on May 15th. And I wanna thank everybody who came out in person or on Zoom to speak to the budget that's before the Council for Action on May 15th. Before we leave this um, body of work, I would like to go back to those two orders that I mentioned earlier where I'm gonna need um, a motion to postpone so that we can take up this body of work all together on May 15th. So um, I look to my colleagues right now, one, we'll do them one at a time. Can I please have a motion to postpone order 200 to the May 15th meeting? So moved. Second. Councillor Dion with a second from Councillor Zaro. Um, is there any, I don't think we need public comment on that motion to postpone. Any, any questions from the council? Um, okay, so it's, again, you'll see it. We'll take it up as a big body of work on the 15th. We'll go ahead to vote to postpone 200. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Trevaro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor yes. Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 200 is postponed. Can I please have a motion to postpone order 201? So moved. Second. Councillor Dion with a second from Councillor Zaro. Any questions on that motion to postpone to May 15th? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councillor Rodriguez? Yes. Councillor Dion? Yes. Councillor Zaro? Yes. Councillor Chabarro? Yes. Councillor Pelletier? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 201 is also postponed to May 15th. Thank you to members of the school uh, administration who are here with us, uh, as well as Chair Lentz, who's here with us this evening. We appreciate it, and we'll see you soon. Uh, okay, so we are now headed into unfinished business, and um, I want to thank our interim city manager and interim corporation council for helping to think through how to manage this body of work that's coming before us. So. Here's what I'm going to propose is that we, um, this is an item that was postponed, so we're bringing it forward. Um, to be um, thorough, we're going to take another motion and second in order to, to get to work um, on the matter. Um, but uh, what, we'll, what we'll do is um, uh, tee up amendments. We've already taken public comments, so we're going to tee up amendments. There's additional stuff in the packet tonight. There might be things coming from the floor. Tee it up, and then rather than take the amendments initially, if it's okay with the council and this made sense to me, we'll debate the item. We'll talk about it. We'll have an opportunity to talk about this big body of work, this this large body of work that's before us tonight. And and once people have their say, then we can take up amendments and take action on amendments in the context of conversation that's been had. Does that make sense to folks? So, um, Councillor Tavaro. Just to clarify, so the um, commentary before the amendments will be on all of the above? 
So we'll we'll have the opportunity to tee up any amendments that will, that are kind of out there. So folks are conscious of what you know what may come. Um, and then, um, but before um, taking up specific amendments to alter the ordinance before us, we can enter into council debate and get a sense of where folks are so that when amendments are offered and a second is sought, we can make our way through those amendments with a little more efficiency. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, and I think in order to get into this discussion that we propose to have, I'm going to ask for a motion, please, um, to a motion to approve order 171. Move passage. Second. Councillor Trevaro with a second from Councillor Fournier. Okay, and now we are in a place where we can start to um, discuss. And what I'm gonna do is start with, I think Councillor Trevaro, you've got some amendments in the packet. Um, give you the floor to tell us what you've you've uh, included or anything else you might wanna share and I'll see if anybody else has information that they'd like to share and then we can get into discussion. Sure, so the um, the item that's listed in the packet um, under number two Trevorrow amendment uh, 42423 is no longer something that I'm going to offer because it's been incorporated into the Trevorrow Rodriguez amendment, which is item number three in the list of attachments. Um, and dated today. Um, so that amendment, the as as I think we understand at this point, the the proposal that sort of is on the table as a as a base point is um, what came out of work our last workshop on this, and um, that was the proposal where we we talked about the structure, the um, the June first um, start date for clean elections, the July 15th, first potential date to receive clean election funding, the four rounds of funding. Um, and the amounts that, that were in that original proposal are technically still what's on the table. The Trevorrow Rodriguez amendment, and I can um, let Councilor Rodriguez um, add anything, but um, basically we sought to, we heard from the council, um, some will to reduce the numbers that were in that proposal, um, particularly the the um, total disbursement for the mayoral race. So we um, settled on numbers that were kind of in between the my original proposal and the mayor's amendment that was brought forward at our last meeting. And so the difference with this amendment from what's currently on the table is that the mayoral total potential distribution is 100,000. And the at-large council races are 30,000 where before they were 40. And um, the only other addition I think is that um, we mimic some language that was in the, it, that's in the state law that um, provides an annual report um, just to give kind of cumulative data on how the program is going and can prompt kind of revisiting around the parameters as um, as needed over time. Um, I think for those the only, Councilor Rodriguez, I'll kind of let you chime in. Thank you, uh, Councilor Tupor. I don't have um, very much to add. I think you covered everything. That report I think was the, the one kind of big different um, piece of it. The other things, which is adjustments, trying to find some sort of compromise between the starting figures that we had and what had been um, discussed as the amendment um, from the mayor. So uh, again, we just, uh, we're attempting to find a, a middle ground, so to speak, uh, in response to what we heard the council were concerns about the, um, the spending. Um, that's, I think that's all. And the um, the other thing is that the so the total cost then is four hundred and sixty five thousand for the first year, and then um, we did look at some projections with the um, the clean elections group did some projections out over time, which indicated that it's likely that this will be sort of a um, a it'll be funded if we fund it at two hundred and fifty thousand every year subsequently we won't actually need to bump it up in the mayoral years. So um, previously where I had had a proposal that had it um, had it funded at a higher level on mayoral years, 
that's gone away with this proposal. This proposal just has 465 for this initial year and then 250 thereafter. Um, so those are the those are the changes. Again, it was um, seeking a compromise between sort of the two proposals and we landed kind of right in the middle. Thank you, Councillor Trevaro and Councillor Rodriguez. I also have um, a couple of amendments in the packet, so I'll take an opportunity to explain them and then I'll see if anybody else has anything to add. Oh, did, Brendan, would, did you wanna weigh in on that? Yes, a few points of clarification just so, um, and I, this may have been, there was a lot of moving parts last, last week, so I apologize. The subsequent um, contribution is 290, um, not 250 just as, so it's lowered from the multiple rounds, whether it's mayoral or not, to just a flat two, 290. And then I think the only other thing, if I, unless I, I was trying to skim, um, the qualifying contribution numbers also went down proportionally. And then just a, um, we did some math on the dates with the, uh, with the city clerk. So um, if there's additional funding under the shortfall provision, it quotes 23 days before the election um, that those funds that no later than for those funds to be distributed. We would ask that there be a friendly amendment to make that 22 days because it falls on a Sunday. So pushing it to the Monday after once we did the all the days. Um, but otherwise, uh, I think the summary was was accurate. Thank you for that clarification. So I have a couple of amendments in, um, as mentioned earlier, uh, my amendment number one that's in the packet is the amendment that was shared last week at our council meeting. And what I had done, um, or this, the spirit behind that was, um, I was looking at the workshop that we had initially, workshop number one, and then I looked at workshop number two, and I was trying to understand the pathway um, forward, and I, I got from some of the discussion on um, workshop number two that uh, while the structure was um, supported by the majority of the council, there was concern about the overall um, budget and the FY24 allocation. And so my intent was to seek a compromise between the Charter Commission's final report um, that and, and, and what the voters saw um, with regard to the proposed budget amount, which was $260,000 and the $500,000 that was talked about at the second workshop. So what I was trying to do with mine was actually compromise between those two numbers, between 260 and between 500. So that's why in my amendment number one, I decreased some of the funding. Um, so for example, I decreased the mayor's funding from mayors, um, the candidates for mayor from 120,000 down to 75,000 for three candidates um, and made some adjustments to other, um, uh, other races as well. Um, so instead of 40,000 for at-large candidates for council, I brought that down to 25,000. And essentially where I landed was a $367,000 FY24 allocation for to fund this program. Program. So again, I went from 500,000 to, to um, uh, 367. Um, and that was that was the compromise um, that I was thinking the council was looking for. After the May, the April 24th meeting. Um, so just after our meeting, I got some feedback from counselors who were saying we should um, uh, actually increase the amount of funding to the mayor candidate and um, and decrease the amount of funding to the at-large city council candidate. So that was the spirit behind, behind amendment number two, which I had included in the packet because I, I, I think I had asked Brandon to draft that on Tuesday or Wednesday after our Monday council meeting, again, in response to people saying, we like your overall budget number, but we wanna shift how much money goes to a mayor candidate versus a city council candidate. And so what you've got in amendment number two there is actually a larger distribution to mayoral candidates up to 85,000, and then a decrease um, uh, to the at-large council candidates from the, the original in our, or, or the first read um, 
amount is 40,000. In my original amendment, I had decreased that amount to 25,000. And in this amendment number two, I decreased that to 15,000. So it's, it was basically a shifting of giving more money to mayoral candidates and a little less money to city council at large candidates. Um, the last thing I will say is when I prepared these two amendments, I was looking to fit within the context of the first read. So I, I was just trying to fit um, uh, within that section under contested races. And so I didn't touch other elements of the ordinance that's in front of us. Um, I was taking the offset from the qualifying contributions that are in our first read, which if, I'm, if my math is right, the offset of the qualifying contributions, um, if everybody gathered all of the qualifying contributions that they are eligible to get would be a little over $20,000. And so even though there would be this $367,000 uh, allocation from our municipal annual operating budget, there would be an offset of roughly $20,000, maybe a little bit less, if not all those qualifying qualifying contributions come in. So I, I think I just wanted to mention that that was the context of qualifying contributions that I was thinking about. Okay, are there any other amendments from the floor that anybody would like to offer before we start to discuss um, the, basically the main motion in front of us, which is uh, the first read? Madam Mayor, I have That's one fine. from the floor. I think copies will be distributed by uh, Brandon in a moment, Brandon Mazur, outside council. But before I start, I want to extend an apology to Council Trevaro. In our last session on this particular policy question, I uh, violated my own line and questioned her motive, accusing her of sacrificing good, seeking perfect. And uh, that wasn't the right thing to say. Um, that was directed at you as an individual when really I should have stuck on the topic, which was a policy question and not question your motive, what your intent was. So since I said it publicly, I have to give you this apology publicly as well. Um, so that said, go ahead, Counselor. Thank you, Counselor. I hadn't even noticed. <laughs> See, that's the trouble with me. I think about things afterwards and I say, I, I don't think that was appropriate, Mark. You know, so I, I just want to put that out there because I think we can get passionate about issues, but as long as they stay on the issues, I think we're successful as a team. But if we start to question our individual motives, that's where it gets all not good. So that's why I just wanted to put that out there. Now, this particular um, amendment that I put out is a little bit probably seen as radical for the proponents of this uh, underlying motion, but I, I did spend the weekend looking at the charter, looking at all the material that's been generated. And in my read of the charter, I come away with this understanding that the charter contemplates the council has two primary responsibilities. One is to pass ordinances that authorize conduct or action by the council or others under its control. And the other one is engaged in appropriations and the allocation of monies to further certain goals. And outside council had somewhat sent us um, a message about that issue and whether or not those two functions should be incorporated in one ordinance. So I spent the weekend taking a look at that question. And as a result, I had further discussions with outside council today, um, as well as the mayor, uh, trying to determine how to strategize this amendment. What it does is simply isolate the bulk of the work around clean elections to an authorizing ordinance. It tells us, tells the community how we will conduct clean elections with all the categories that have been outlined in its core document. What it does remove are references to actual fiscal numbers and would transfer that question to the budget process is where allocations are made and budgets are constructed. And I think that's important because it separates what are two really distinct questions from each other. If you remove the fiscal language from this ordinance, it can live on in perpetuity without much modification from any council. 
Conversely, every council every year will have to engage in a budget process to determine how much money will be allocated to the clean election uh, endeavor moving forward. And we kind of know we're going to do that because there's all this talk about mayoral race years, non-mayoral race years, contested, uncontested. But how we assign that money and how we distribute it to a pool of candidates are fiscal questions, not policy on the question of whether or not we have a clean election mechanism in this city. So that's, <clears throat> that's what this does. It uh, eliminates a lot of the, well, it, it eliminates entirety, the Trevorrow Rodriguez Amendment, not on its merits, but on the fact that it's, be, it's a question being asked in the wrong forum. And therefore, that's, that's the core premise of this. We can pass policy this evening on the question of clean election, what we mean by that. And then we can have a budget discussion, which we'll end up having every year within the confines and the boundaries of an actual budget document as to how much money we allocate there. So some of this language that a majority of you might agree to would just be resurfaced in another context. And I know some would say well, it seems like a lot of semantics. And I apologize for that because it can seem that way. But the reality is there's little support, and we got kind of a signal about that, for merging what should be a budget decision with a policy and authorization decision. The two should remain separate. So that's, that's the premise of my amendment. It's, um, it's just putting the right questions in their proper spaces as opposed to merging them in one space, because we're going to get to visit this in the budget, and that's where it should be. And I guess in future years, its first stop would be at the Finance Committee to at least draw out the rough boundaries of what that budget would look like, and then move it forward to the whole council for their own amendments and interpretations. But nonetheless, how it processes through as a budget item um, is what's important, that it's a budget item, not authorizing language. And, I, and I'll close with this. I, I know there's some reference in the chart, a question that brought clean elections forward around independence. I've interpreted that because there are a lot of words in there that are open to interpretation, sufficiency, viability, that as long as it maintains an independent budget line and the clerk's itemized budget, it exists. And it will exist as long as this council or our successors uh, see to it that it exists and is adequately funded. But their, their understanding of what sufficiency and viability will change with each council and each cycle of an election as to what constitutes an appropriate budget. So that's what this amendment does. And I, I just want you to be able to think about that concept. So. It's not so much about language, but about structure and where things should lie. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Dion. Any other amendments at this time before we get into discussion of the main motion? Okay, I don't think anybody at this moment is, is offering additional amendments, which doesn't preclude us from having that happen as we make our way through debate. So I will open up the conversation to any counselors who would like to just weigh in on where we are at this point in time. I'm, I'm, then I will, I'll, um, I'll be happy to jump in and, and just sort of share my thinking. I don't, I don't, um, like I said, I was, I was, I, for me, I, I've been trying to catch up from workshop number one to workshop number two, and then our discussion last week. And um, I think uh, I'll just throw out a few things here. Um, I actually, I think, I think it's really interesting, Councillor Dion's um, uh, separation of the budget decision from the policy decision. Uh, I'm, I'm not, at least off the top of my head, I can't think of other ordinances where we establish the funds to implement the ordinance 
within the ordinance itself, because of course that's an annual budget decision. Um, uh, and, and it will be in this case as well. Right now we have the city managers recommended um, funding in FY24 for clean elections. And if whether that change is in the ordinance or um, outside the ordinance, it's, it's gonna be something that we'll have to address through the FY24 finance committee and council process to establish our annual operating budget. I think it's also, this the, the memo that um, Perkins Thompson put together for us after the last meeting I thought was helpful as well. Um, and I think they touched on that in the section five, um, talking about adopting the charter language with regard to the ordinance and having the funding levels live outside of that. So that that makes some sense to me. I don't, um, I, I regret, I, I, I try not to miss too many meetings, but I did miss our second workshop. And so I, I, I feel a little bit late to the party, but that's my fault. Um, I think that for me, I was happy to, to offer those two amendments that are in our packet because I, I actually really felt like 260 was the number um, as the Charter Commission issued their final report and made that recommendation. I thought that's where we were landing. And so to, to move up to 500 to me felt like too much. So, but but that, again, that, that sort of budget um, and you know we can take that up as we will and, and folks will, um, offer their um, their support where they think think things are best. Um, so just generally for me, I'll say that um, you know I've been in favor of making this as simple as we can for candidates. For me, that's that's part of the point is to level the playing field and make it easy for candidates. So for me, I thought a couple of things: seed funding without offset makes it easier for candidates. So let's not back out seed funding. Um, from the distribution from the city. Let's let people raise seed money starting on June 1 when they take out their papers to be a clean elections candidate and use that seed funding. Sorry, June. Oh, it's June 30th. I thought it was June 1st. No, when you oh. take out papers as a candidate. Oh, but it, you can declare your, you can take your out your declaration intent form on June 1. If you guys pass that. If we pass for, that. For, for this purposes only. <laughs> Anyway, so my, my thought about seed funding is raise your, raise your seed funding, spend it, we're not gonna have it count against you. I also, in our first workshop, I liked the conversation we had about the New Mexico model regarding prorating. If we establish a certain amount of funding for mayor candidates, and there's four instead of three, I say prorate the money um, without having people go out and do private fundraising. Because again, I think that if you prorate, it levels the playing field for candidates and um, people maybe are in the mindset that I'm a clean elections candidate. Shoot, I didn't wanna go out and have to do private fundraising. So I'm, I'm more in the camp of let's prorate um, and not have candidates who qualify as clean election candidates have to go out and do private fundraising if the funding is depleted on a first come first serve basis. Um, oh, I'm also a big fan of clean elections candidates qualifying for the city of Portland ballot before receiving distribution from the municipal clean elections program. And I totally acknowledge that this year is difficult because of the timing, because we basically say you can't turn in your signature papers until August 14th. So that's the earliest you could receive a distribution. I could live with that because as many people say and have even said around this, this table, um, the campaign really begins after Labor Day. But I understand that the will of the council may be that um, candidates need the money before August 14th. But I kind of liked that two distribution model that was included in the charter. I think the charter commission's report contemplated two distributions. And for me, it made sense to have that initial distribution start as soon as you qualified as a candidate. And the second one could be distributed um, uh, at, at that second um, date, which I think is August 28th. Um, so anyway, that, that's where I am. Um, I, again, I, I realize I may not be in the majority here, um, but I thought I would at least weigh in on where I am. Happy to talk through my amendments and offer those, whether or not people uh, approve them or, or um, offer their support, up to you. Um, Councilor Dion, I'm interested in talking about yours as well because ultimately we're gonna take this up at the Finance Committee anyway. Um, we're gonna have to. So that's it for me, Councilor Trevorrow. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I kind of feel at this point like we have talked the components of this to, to death. 
um, over the course of several meetings. Um, so I will just restate that the, the frame with which I am approaching this is to fulfill what I see as the council's obligation to create a program that is viable and attractive to candidates so that the clean election program can do what clean election programs do, which is to prevent private interest from entering into campaigns and to equalize the playing field for candidates who might not otherwise have access to uh, big donors. Um, in order for those things to happen though, we have to create a viable program. We have to create something that candidates look at and say, you know, it's beneficial for me to opt into this as opposed to raise private funding. And that requires setting the amounts at just the right number. If we set the mayoral uh, max distribution, for instance, at 85 or $75,000, there are going to be plenty of candidates who will look at that and say, I can raise that privately, and I don't have to deal with all the red tape of clean elections, and I don't have to wait until July 15th to get a distribution. I can start my campaign right away, which has historically been the case in campaigns if we, if we were to review the um, campaign finance reports. Um, so to me, the numbers that we've come up with um, in the Trevorrow Rodriguez amendment are the right numbers. And I would ask my, um, my colleagues to go with it <laughs> and we can see how it works out this year. Um, and we can revise it next year. With regard to the um, to Councilor Dion's amendment, I I appreciate the rationale behind it, um, the sort of division between uh, policy and procedure. And normally, I think that um, we set policy; we don't set procedure. However, in this case, the charter amendment that was adopted by the voters did the policy for us. It said that the council shall establish a fund. It's, it mimics the state law and the state, the state has the structure and the funding in, in the state statute itself. Um, so I think that that is the work that we that is incumbent upon us today. It will require a simple budget amendment, which we can take up in finance committee um, to provide the additional funding for this. It should equate to less than 0.1% on the tax rate. Um, to me, I think it's worth it to create a viable program this year for candidates. And I hope that um, my colleagues can support that. Um, and I'll ask the mayor to let me know when will be the appropriate time to offer that amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Other um, comments, Councillor Rodriguez? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, don't, I don't want to repeat what Councillor Chavarro just said because I think she framed it um, very eloquently. Um, I would just say that, you know, from what I heard um, from my colleagues um, in terms of the the amounts of distribution um, was a bit of like kind of like, you know, what was it called like sticker shock, right? Like price, you know, was it, it mind blowing how much money is spent. Um, and, I, and I sort of sympathize with that. But I, I want to remind us that those numbers weren't arbitrary. You know, what we're looking at were historical fundraising from campaigns. So we we actually came down from what had historically been raised uh, in this compromise, because we heard that people had like that feeling of it, but but we didn't make up these numbers, right? We were, we were basing it on history. And I think that if we go really far below what had historically been fundraised, we are going to create a system that's not appealing to potential candidates because, because they know what others have done and they can expect what their opponents um, will raise. And so again, we wanna make this a, an appealing uh, program for candidates. Um, and I think just to to speak a little bit of the the additional language of asking for a report, the annual report, I think that that was very much um, trying to acknowledge the fact that we're, you know, at the beginning, we started to talk about this as a pilot program, which, you know, might have not been the right framing because, you know, it's, it, it is what it's going to be. It is just the program that we're setting forward. But having that report will allow us to look back and have, you know, have to have an informed decision based on the information that has taken place after one year um, has take, has been used, as after one year of usage of the program. So um, I feel like these things have satisfied what the big items that I've heard from the council surface. 
um, with our, excuse me, that I believe that our compromise um, amendment has uh, satisfies those concerns. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Zaro. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I think my first question would be for the manager. Did we by any chance uh, prepare for this evening um, for both the Trevor Rodriguez amendment and the Snyder amendment, um, what the tax rate increase would be depending on? Either. No, we did not. And the reason for that is because we're going to have that discussion in the finance committee. This is a separate discussion that we will have there. My my budget proposal, as the mayor mentioned, include $260,000 uh, for that. Um, so each each year, as I think Councillor Diane also expressed, we'll be having, no matter what the ordinance says, we'll be having that discussion constantly and we'll, we'll prepare um, every year, obviously, for those specific discussions about what the amounts are the council wants to include and then what the tax rate increase would be specifically. And okay. so we will be ready for that in the finance committee. Well, lucky me, I'll be there. Um, I, I think, but for the context of this year, because it is so unusual, because we're instituting this for the first time, so close to when we'll be voting on the budget that um, this year, our vote this evening, unless we we move towards Councilor Dion's from the floor, we will be setting it based on one of these amendments. We will be, we will be, that, that's what we're looking at this evening. It's still gonna require an amendment to my proposed budget in the finance committee. Okay. Actually procedurally a really interesting point. <laughs> um, thank you for flagging that. Um, okay, so for me, I, I said last week that I was um, somewhere in between, you know, what the mayor had brought last week, it's since changed a little bit and what um, the original proposal was and, and tried to find something that was in the difference this week as well. And it, it was evident that that wasn't going to happen. Um, I do think that, uh, listen, either way, whichever amendment we're looking at right now, with the exception of Councillor Dines from the floor, I think that we are looking at a lot of red tape. I think we are looking at a lot of layers that I would be very surprised if this time next year that the council that is working on this next year is not going to be working diligently to kind of fix the, you know, what we learn over the next, you know, few months. Uh, I think we all know that is probably going to be the case. Um, I still have a little sticker shock. I'm one of the ones you named, Councillor. Uh, although I know that the investment is important. I'm, I'm trying to figure out, though, if we should be setting this for what we want to see as the outcome of how much money should be in this versus the reality of what the, the market, for lack of a better term, dictates for candidates in, in, this, in these races. So that's, that's kind of what I'm stuck between right now. But I feel like for me at this point, um, I would have loved to be able to look at tax rate uh, potential increases for this, but obviously we won't do that right now. Um, that was my only question at this point. I, I think for, for me at this point, I, I'm still having a hard time seeing uh, such a jump from what, we, what voters voted on in November um, to see such a significant increase. although. I think the merit of it is, you know, it's coming from a good place and I know we want it to be competitive. I just think it's so subjective that what might be competitive, in my opinion, is going to be so different from what you think. And then looking at, you know, the last few years of races and how much was actually spent uh, versus what we're looking at potentially spending. So that's just a little uh, snapshot into what I'm, I'm thinking at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zaro. Next was Councillor Phillips. And after Councillor Phillips, I saw a hand up from Councillor Pelletier. I, um, I first want to um, um, appreciate everybody's extremely hard work on this. We've had several conversations about it. Um, and um, I do think we want to get it to a place where it's pretty perfect um, because that's what we need to do for the folks out there that are thinking about running um, and being a clan elections candidate. Um, and so, um, and we've also done a lot of research. We've, we've, everybody's done research. And from what I hear and what I understand is these numbers didn't, didn't just appear on a page. These numbers were numbers that were really thought out and they were researched because that is what was, that was what was um, spent. 
um, on previous um, elections. Um, and so these weren't just, and I know nobody's saying that, they just weren't arbitrary um, numbers. Um, and so because of that, I've, I've taken a look at this. I've talked to um, a lot of different, different people. Um, I, um, I, I think that I can clearly see at this point in time um, that I do support the Trevorrow Rodriguez um, amendment um, that has been put for us, and um, and that's how I plan to vote tonight. Thank you, Councillor. Next to you, Councillor Pelletier. Thank you. I'm going to try and keep it short and sweet too. I like that energy. Um, we have talked about this a lot. Uh, and I think for me, it comes down to, I, I really want us to fully fund this program. Um, you know, it's really important that we set a precedent for this program because it's the first of its kind here. And this was supported by the voters. This was, this was enacted by the charter and supported by the voters. The language in the charter recommendation was to fully fund the clean elections program. And I know we've talked about like playing semantics with words. I don't wanna play semantics with the words fully and fund and figure out what they mean or how much we should put in. It, it just means to fund it adequately. And I think the amendment that was provided by counselors Trevorrow and Rodriguez um, I would have actually liked to stay at a higher amount that we were at at the last meeting, but I think that that represents a compromise within that within that amendment. And I think as it was stated um, several times now, these are not numbers that are made up. These are numbers that are pulled from data, and this policy is being crafted from data. And this is the, this is like the workflow um, and the process that I know people love in here. So we are doing the workflow and the process. Um, and I think that this needs to be a competitive program. And I'm worried that we're not really investing in this in the way that I think that we should be. Um, and I'm also very aware that we invest significant money in many things without having this much of a conversation. So I think we invest in this program um, and we move forward with doing what the voters have asked us to do in terms of this clean election program. Um, and, and really, again, take the data that was pulled and, and support that and support the compromise. Because again, I think we went significantly lower than what we were at at, the, at this last meeting. So I'm definitely in support of fully funding this program the way that we were asked to, the way it was written in the charter. Um, you know, and, and I think we owe it to the voters who are asking us to do this and what what was written in the charter to actually move move forward with that. I know we've talked about it a ton um, and I know there are a lot of other amendments out there, but I, I do think that, again, it is on us to make this program start as successfully as possible. And I'm concerned that if we if we backtrack or if we don't start out with funding it, that we're never actually gonna fund it. Like I'm, I'm worried that if we set this precedent of, of not funding it or not funding it as much as maybe we would like to, that we're really setting ourselves up for failure in the coming years. So thank you. Thank you, counselor. Uh, can I jump in with a quick question to attorney Mazur? And um, this is not, this is a genuine question because I wanna make sure that I'm really understanding things correctly. And again, I missed that second workshop. So, you know, this, this document here, um, what's the title of the topic? Well, it, of it was, it was, <laughs> it was, it was handed out at the second workshop and it's, it's called the counselor Trevorrow proposal. And sure. on the back, it has kind of a funding, um, schedule. And when I was trying to understand all this, I was talking to you and I said, is there, and I think I had had a conversation with, uh, counselor Rodriguez as well. I was trying to understand the the data that fed, you know, any one of our um, of our proposals here. And you had said to me, I think, and this is where my question is, you said, there's historical data that tells us the number of candidates for whom we are targeting funding. So three mayor candidates, at-large candidates, so on and so forth. But, so am, am I correct in saying that the number of candidates was based on historical data, a 10-year look through the clerk's office? The number on... Yes, on those, on that one, it, it was my original for the first workshop. I had gamed it out with just some random, not looking back. Paul Riley from the clerk's office provided me the data. So other than the very first mayoral year, which had, I think, 18 candidates. So we kind of threw that That's right. out. Um, it was uh, based on the historical 
10 year. And we looked at specifically the seats that are up this year. So seats, uh, districts uh, four and five at large, we just took at large generally and, and, and took the average. So what I'm trying to get at here is the, we used historical data to kind of define how many candidates do we think we'll see on the ballot and who might need to qualify for clean elections. But, and again, I could be wrong here. My sense was that we had wondered about the historical data to inform the amount of funding for a candidate, but you had said that we never actually got that. Is that we, right? Or do we I have didn't that wrong? independently analyze that. Back in January, the council received uh, a memo from the Maine Citizens for Clean Elections, which had um, put in some, some numbers, had what looked like uh, reviewed historical data um, so when our, when we did our first draft for the very first workshop, we we said we just used those numbers. So that's where the hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So Got it is it. based on historical data, not that we independently verified, but came from that Jan okay. like January memo. From and was that a ten year look back? Roughly, it, it, it depended on the seat. There were some that I think went slightly further back, but average about ten years. Okay, thank you for the clarification, um, Councilor Fournier. You had a hand up. Thank you. I'm trying to remember what I was going to ask. <laughs> um, I think, you know, the first thing I, I believe in clean elections so much that I signed on to a lawsuit against the city for it. And I couldn't be part of our deliberations when we were talking about it and eventually took myself off. Um, and so for me, you know, I think, yes, and Councillor Trevor and I had a conversation about it, Councillor Rodriguez and I had a conversation about it. Um, you know, the initial numbers are it is a sticker shot because you're like, why are we spending $100,000 on a mayoral race for a city with less than 70,000 people? However, I have to then walk that back a little bit in my brain with what I do for work every day. I go around the country talking to people who are everyday citizens who have never had the opportunity to have a voice or be a participant in a race who are competing against people who have significant real estate connections or significant political connections. Um, when we look at Alaska, you have populations that are 75% native and yet have never held a municipal or county seat that makes the decisions that directly affect their population. And so while, yes, that's a sticker shock to me, I think I spent maybe $11,000 on my own um, last at-large campaign I try and remember who this program is designed for. And it's really designed, I know it's designed to keep, you know, some of the influence out of elections. It's designed to level the playing field and also create opportunity for people who historically have not been able to run and sit in these seats competitively. Um, so while I appreciate that it is um, a little bit more then I would feel comfortable spending on my own campaign. I am thinking about who else this program is designed for. And so I um, am in full support of uh, the amendment brought forward by Councilor Rodriguez and Councilor Trevorrow this evening. Um, I also appreciate the reporting mechanism in which we can look at how did it go and bringing it back next year, what do we need to do to adjust it? That's That's what we do as we review everything every year. How do we need to fix it? How do we need to adjust it? That's part of continuous improvement. Um, and so I do believe we need to make a good investment this first year to make it viable so that people feel comfortable stepping in and doing it, knowing that they would have likelihood of having their full campaign funded. Um, and so that is where I'm at this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Dion? This is a tough one. I, I've spent some time thinking about it, but. I, I'm going to vote against this measure. Okay, I, I've got to go home and sell it to my constituents that the sticker shock makes sense. I can give a worthy speech. I think I'm capable of that. But I just spent the weekend at a neighborhood meeting of 30 residents and they hit me pretty hard on taxes. And they pointed to their kids and they say, can we afford to live here anymore? And I know that sounds dramatic, but that's a real thing for real people. I now want to sound like Council Fournier, because oftentimes she says exactly what I'm thinking, and then I don't have to speak. But when it comes to this pre-candidate status, I can't get there. I'm sorry. Either you're a candidate or you're not. I, I just, this pre-candidate and 
this trust me, I'll give you the money back if it all falls apart. I'm sorry, I can't do that either. And we heard that we'd have to have a collection effort. That means staff time and it's fruitless in my private life. I know how you can get a judgment, but can you collect? Pretty unlikely. And that's why I said, we need to be honest that if we give somebody money and they go, gee, golly whiz, I'm out, that we have to eat that debt. And that's not gonna look good to the public either. And then the, the other piece I thought about is, you remember I talked about simplicity? I think a system, especially for neophytes coming in as candidates who don't understand systems, the cleaner it is, the more linear it is, the easier for them to participate. Participate, but actually by actually campaigning, not worrying about forms, deadlines, where do I show up, get my money. We've put in so many steps here. And I actually worry about the city clerk staff. They're overburdened. And now we have all these reporting dates, all these candidates coming in for their cash out. To me, that's, if I'm gonna support it, it's gotta be really simple, very clear with few decision points attached to it. So, and I firmly believe in the proposition I said to you all earlier, is the policy of clean elections belongs in an ordinance and the financial questions belong in a budget process. No other function of city government do we isolate those two components into one ordinance. You know, I'm sure other department heads say, how come I can't get an ordinance and make life a lot easier that we could just show up to the finance committee with our ticket punched. Here's our cost not to be questioned. I think the finances of this process or any other process has to be questioned against the context of an entire city budget, not in isolation. So I suspect I might even be a minority of one this evening, you know, so I'm going to borrow Councillor Phillips' comment, well, my decision doesn't count, does it? I think it does. I think if I am a minority voice, it creates a record for others to undertake at some future cycle, but it has to be said. And I have to say that to my constituents as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I don't, I don't think you're gonna be a minority of one um, because I think I'm gonna be joining you. I, um, I feel like we have spent meaningful work on this and I don't want to, I fully respect the outcome of the council. You know, we, that's where we are and, and I can live with that. But for me, I feel like we went from um, a, a packet from Perkins Thompson at workshop one to a first read product out of workshop two that was kind of, a, it's a full ordinance. And so when I dove into this after the second workshop, I thought, how can I fit into this this drafted ordinance that um, that challenges me um, in a couple of different ways. I I did notice I felt like we're writing a we're we're writing an annual budget decision into ordinance, and then I thought, well, how can I fit in there by offering an amendment that at least lowers the amount because I wasn't comfortable with the five hundred thousand, um, but but I I didn't think there was room for the things I talked about a little bit earlier tonight like. Do you need to qualify for the ballot before you get taxpayer funded um, uh, distributions and um, and 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 other things? So, um, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not suggesting that we that we all need more time to work on this. If if I had, I, again, I, when I held this up last week and I was like, I'm trying to fit within this, you know, this this big ordinance. Um, I really thought we could we could spend six months on this. Um, and 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 I would because I think it's that important. I do think that a municipal clean elections program is a great opportunity for people. Um, I think it does offer access, which is really important. Um, I ran in 2019. I raised a bunch of money, but I didn't raise as much as the people I ran against. And at that time, there was a lot of criticism about how much money we were all raising. So I actually don't think you need 100 or 120 thousand to run a campaign. I did it. I don't think you need to do TV. I did TV. <laughs> I don't think you really need to in a city of 68,000 people. So for me, there's just too much here that, that causes me um, pause. I, I think the multiple rounds of distribution 
is a ton on the clerk. I actually think it's a ton on candidates as well. Um, I, I feel like we don't have a clear handle on what those qualifying contributions will bring into the city because there's some there's some flex there. So I, you know, like I said, I mean, as with all things, um, I can I can live in the minority, but I'm I'm probably not going to get there for five hundred thousand or four hundred sixty five thousand. And I think there's other things here that um, that need to be addressed. And I have I have the time, and I'm happy to stay around tonight and and talk about specifics of the ordinance that we've got in front of us. Like I said, I'd I'd love to make sure that people qualify for the ballot before we start to distribute funding. I think that as Councillor Dion was saying, right now we're asking taxpayers in the city of Portland to fund candidates. We've never done that before. We've never said we're going to collect your taxpayer dollars and ask you to fund campaigns. So again, in a town of 68,000 people, it seems like a lot to, 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 to dedicate to uh, political campaigns. Um, that's where my sensibility is. I think we could do it for less. I think I could, I could support the dollars um, that I put forward, but I don't think the rest of the council is going to be there with me, but um, that's where I am. So let's. Council Rodriguez. Mayor, um, I guess I would want to formally move or make a motion for the amendment that's uh, labeled or that's um, titled uh, the Trouble or Rodriguez Amendment to 2023-501. So we have a motion to amend order 171. I think I'm on the right number there. Do I have that right? Um, motion to amend order 171 um, from Councilor Rodriguez. And we're, we're looking at the amendment from the uh, Councilor Trevorrow and Councilor Rodriguez. Second. Councilor Trevorrow with a second. Is there discussion on the amendment? Brandon, do you have something to add? Just with the change in the 22, 23 days to the 22 days would all would be all I'd ask if we can amend that from the floor. We can do that as friendly. Yeah. Thank you. Point of order to the chair. Councilor Dion. A question for the chair. Should my uh, floor amendment uh, come forward at this juncture? Because if if it prevails, then of course, the uh, Trevaro Rodriguez amendment would not exist. So I, th I think just as a matter of process, uh, my amendment should be considered by the body first. I, I, I look to corporation council maybe for a little guidance on this front because conversely, one could argue if their amendment prevails, yours becomes moot. Is that true? Okay. Okay. Given the way that, given the structure, given the way the other ones are, are structured. Procedurally, the amendments that I have offered, I think, have become moot. I mean, I could offer them, but I think I'm sort of in a position right now where I'm feeling like after debate, I don't know if it's really worth author offering them formally. But we could take them up in order to to address them. Well, they haven't they haven't been moved yet, right? They've right. just been sort of generally discussed. So, That's right. Yeah. So Same with all of them, right? Correct. So my question is, do we need to take up Councillor Dion's before we take up Councillor Trevaro and Rodriguez's in order to um, address it, or is it addressed once we take up the Trevaro Rodriguez amendment? I, I I would I think I would advise taking up the Dion amendment first. Okay. Is that okay with two of you? We'll suspend the Trevaro Rodriguez amendment for the moment and take up the Dion amendment. That's fine with me. So I'll, I guess I'll withdraw my motion. Okay, and then we'll come back to you. Okay. Councilor Dion, would you like to make a motion? I move the adoption of a floor amendment, um, creating a division in the underlying motion sending all fiscal matters contained therein um, to the finance committee and the remainder of the remainder of that underlying motion to be decided by this body as outlined in the amended document that was distributed to council today. Uh, Councilor Diane, I'll second your amendment. Is there any discussion on the amendment? 
Thank you for offering it. And um, we'll go ahead and vote on it. Councilor Fournier? No. Councilor Rodriguez? No. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Zaro? No. Councilor Javaro? No. Councilor Pelletier? No. Councilor Phillips? No. Mayor Snyder? Yes. That amendment fails six to two. And uh, so now we're back, and I'm going to look to Councilor Rodriguez once more. Uh, so move to amend order 171 with the amendment that's titled the Trevorrow Rodriguez amendment on the package. Thank you. Um, Councilor Trevorrow with the second. Is there discussion on that amendment? Okay. Councilor Zaro. Thank you, Mayor. I, I just have, a, I meant to ask this before and then got distracted. For this amendment, it would apply to yours as well if you were to be considering it. Um, we vote on these numbers. They say they pass. That is not binding next year, correct? It's not binding in the FY24 budget until we vote on the FY24 budget. And the next Good. session's council can come in and say, nah, we're gonna change this completely, correct? By, uh, by amending the ordinance, right? Right, that the, having the, having the, the the numbers in the ordinance, the ordinance, is, the ordinance is being approved by the council and it can be amended by the council through the same process. Okay, I that just didn't know, I, I don't feel like it, that was named tonight to, and I needed it to be. To clarify, there's a notion in law we, you, that you can't bind future legislatures. So regardless, even though you can put it in the ordinance and this year you'll put it in, you'll have to amend the budget as the city manager mentioned to, to properly match this number. But next year, it's going to be a whole new process, and you can't require the council to to match the four hundred and sixty four thousand for for next year's budget. Same, similarly, um, that's why for the additional funding language, you couldn't force the council to appropriate additional funds. You can go through your process and vote to appropriate additional funds, but you can't sort of predetermine that those funds are going to be issued. Yeah. Does that make does, does that clarify? So the, the number is pretty much irrelevant for, for next year's budget process. You'll have to go through and, and sort of redo this. And I think getting to the report that helps a little bit. But and, and Brandon, can I just ask a follow-up on that? And so essentially, I think what you're saying, just correct me if I'm wrong, is just that we're not bound to it next year. And so therefore it's basically unenforceable, essentially. It's unenforceable. It can be used as a guiding post, but it's it's unenforceable to on future councils and future councils mean future council. So when you see in December or January, it's it's a new council and and that direct line item is is unenforceable. All right. Thank you. That's helpful. And, and I misspoke. I didn't mean to say irrelevant. I meant not binding, um, but you've you've done a good job of of painting that picture for me. Thank you. That's all. Thank you, Councillor. I have a I have a quick question under the short all provisions of the amendment. Um, it, it, a couple things. So the first is it says um, if, if, if there's additional money needed, the city council may by resolution appropriate additional amounts. Um, this is totally semantics, but I figured I'd ask, wouldn't that be an order? Or would that be an order rather than a resolution if it was a city council action to appropriate additional it's funds? Second rate, right? It would, I think it would, it would, I think that's why I'm asking, just in case we can decrease confusion in the future. So the language um, I pulled from this budgetary policies and procedures, I didn't want to bug Brendan through this process since you're in the middle of budgetary. So in the execution, um, it states, and I, I just pulled this, the city council may by resolution appropriate additional amounts only up to the amount of excess revenues and unencumbered budget surplus remaining after the purpose of the original appropriation has been satisfied. At the end of the fiscal year, all un unencumbered appropriations lapse unless specifically continued. So we just pulled that language from city of Portland budgetary policies and procedures. So it references resolution. I can certainly try to meet, meet the parlance that's accurate, but that's where I, I, I think the mayor may be correct. I think that we would normally um, execute that with an order. Um, I think the resolve that you're mentioning is the appropriation resolve that we approve every year as part of the budget process, but it would be a subsequent, I think, order following that up. It's just semantics, but I think that could be, um, that would be resolved just by a change of that word. 
So it would be the city council made by order instead of by resolution. So we could do that by friendly amendment. Would that be the preference? So that's fine. Right. Okay. Um, thank you. So I leave that up to the authors if you want to offer that up. The other um, quick question that I had under the short fall provision was, and just just to be, this isn't even part of it, it. Just to be clear that if a candidate doesn't receive the full funding contemplated for their race, they could raise money privately, right? They, okay. Yeah. Um, so the first thing that would happen is if the fund becomes depleted, then it comes to the council. The council decides whether or not to replenish the fund. In the event that the council decides not to replenish the fund, then the candidates can raise private dollars up to what they would have qualified for under the clean election. Okay. Fund. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. That's that's it for my questions. Can I have a question? Would they get initial dis distribution with clean elections funding and then we're saying that they can then raise private funds so it would be the intent at least here um is once it hits the twenty five thousand dollars in the fund the clerk's office would would come to the council ask for additional appropriations um if the council chooses not to appropriate additional funds that candidate would then be able to still they have to go out and collect their qualifying contributions in order to sort of trigger that release and raise the funds sort of as a, in essence, like a traditional candidate, up to $500 contributions from an individual up to the amount that they would have received. So um, as an example, if, if for whatever reason, a mayor's candidate, a candidate for mayor did not get um, the fully funded um, and they, let's say they got none, for a supplemental, they would be able to go out and raise uh, the first round of twenty thousand dollars for a supplemental distribution. Does that make sense? I'm hoping I'm not confusing it by using numbers, but um, they still have to qualify for that round of supplemental funding and can only raise what they would have otherwise received. So if they if there was still a little bit in the fund and they got five thousand out of the fund, they would only be able to raise an additional fifteen traditionally. So yes. <laughs> I'm so I think I think as long as there are fun, funds available in the clean election the fund, then you disperse on a first come first so serve basis. Arguably, they're going to bring in some money because of the qual not a time, but because of the qualifying contributions. That's likely going to go into the fund and come right back out to the candidate. Um, but that if it's depleted, likely they're going to be having to go out and traditionally fund. So there is going to be, and this is contemplated to be truly first come first serve. So if somebody gets it in at 1101, that that candidate should be certified before somebody that turns in their paperwork at 1102. One other quick question. Um, the I, the am amendment does contemplate fewer qualifying contributions from each level of candidate from the first read ordinance, is that right? Yes, I think it was just in the first around and um the idea is that they're qualifying for less funds so they should have to raise less qualifying contributions okay so like i'm just looking at the difference so instead of 345 qualifying contributions to total um it would go down to 300 for the mayor i don't have it in front of me so I so yeah so um the subsequent number of qualifying contributions goes down. So the increment of 100 additional qualifying mm. contributions, for a you can do it three, three rounds. So it's instead of 345, it's 300. So it was lowered from 115 to 100. Um, similarly, for all the way down, down the ticket, um, the initial did not change. And I'd have to go back to the actual full amendment to, to look at what That's the- That's right. It's, it, I was, I misspoke. It's, so the initial round stays the same. It's the supplemental rounds that okay. are less. Thank you. I figure we're all gonna get asked questions about this. So it's, it's good to ask the questions while we're here tonight. Any other questions on the Rodriguez-Trevorrow? Amendment. 
Councillor Trevorrow. I, I don't have questions. I just, um, you know, and I don't want to delay our process here, but I just thought I would address a couple of um, things that have come up. And I appreciate where everybody's coming from on this. Um, with regard to the early um, disbursement, which happens before nomination petitions get fully verified. Um, and we talked about this last time, but uh, my level of comfort comfortability comes from the fact that they're only going to be eligible for the uncontested amount at that point, and that they have to sign that affidavit. And I, I agree with Councillor Dion that you know it, it may be very challenging to enforce that. We can follow somebody around with a money judgment to every place where they go, as long as we have that enforcement. Um, but I think that the, the challenge of collecting nomination signatures compared to the challenge of collecting qualified contributions um, is, is so much less significant that it's unlikely that we're going to run into a scenario where somebody who qualifies for clean elections doesn't then go on to qualify as a candidate. Um, and this is only for the first year. We, I think it's incumbent upon this body to, I think um, our deadline to um, put forward a charter amendment would be sometime, I think in August, um, to change that nomination petition uh, timeline so that it can be in accordance with the clean election fund for going forward. Um, so that's that's one. And, and granted, I, I recognize this proposal is taking a little bit of a leap of faith from, from some of my colleagues, both in terms of numbers and in terms of the um, structural components. Um, but I think it's, it's worth it to create a program that candidates are going to use. The other point that I just wanted to address, um, Councillor Zaro, your contemplation of whether the, the maximum distribution should be what we have seen historically versus what we would like it to be. I think um, the, the line that we begin to cross when we, when we go with what we think it should be is whether candidates are gonna actually use it or not. And if candidates don't use it, if this program doesn't get maximum participation, then it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Um, so, you know, it's in the spirit of creating a really robust and workable clean elections program that, um, that I think we've offered this amendment and um, we hope that you'll support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Other discussion on the amendment before us? Okay, we'll go ahead and vote. Councillor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? No. Councilor Zaro? No. Councilor Trevorrow? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? No. So the amendment passes five to three. So we're back at the main motion as amended. Here we go, main motion as amended. So discussion on that, because our next logical step will be um, to vote on the ordinance that's been amended. Before I forget though, you said we need to make an amendment tonight from the floor about something uh, kind of clerical and I wanna make sure I don't forget to do that. Can you tell me what it is again? <laughs> I think there are just two minor wording changes within the Trevara Rodriguez amendment, um, and I'll look um, to Corporation Council on the procedure, but it would be changing the word resolution by resolution to by order under subsection 966 F under the shortfall provisions and changing the 23 day reference to, to 22 days. Was the, the I think we did that by was friendly that those amendment. done by friendly amendment at the yeah, I think both of those were addressed okay. by then I think we're we're good because okay. the Trevaro the I think the clerical thing that you may be referencing mayor was um, we changed the timing in Councillor Trevaro and Rodriguez amendment for the city clerk those were not included in your amendments and I didn't want to lose sight of those if a different amendment went forward but I think we are as long as those pass with a friendly amendment then I think we're okay and we can work those changes in 
response. So, so section 9-66 had two changes. Um, Under subsection F. Subsection F. So instead of by resolution, we say by order. And instead of 23 days before the election, it's 22 days before the election. I believe that both of those issues were corrected okay. earlier in the discussion after the after the motion was made. Okay. But, but yeah. I, and I just want to double check. Um, Actually, 22 days works because it'll be the Monday. It'll be the Monday, yep. Okay. Good oak. Well, we've got it recorded. <laughs> Okie doke. So we, again, we're back at the main motion as amended. Further discussion? Um, thanks, everybody, for for hard work here. I'm... I'm uh, you know, I've, 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 I've used my five minutes tonight. Um, I'm not going to vote uh, in favor of this tonight. And it's, um, but I also want to be clear that I'm very appreciative of my colleague, in particular, Councillor Trevorrow, your um, leadership on this issue and the work that the community has has done and, and other councillors as well. I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the budget amount. Um, I'm uncomfortable with distributing taxpayer dollars to people who haven't yet qualified for the ballot. Um, I'm uncomfortable with putting uh, budget allocations in an ordinance. Um, so those are the, that's my rationale. Um, it's not that I don't appreciate um, and support the um, implementation of a municipal clean election program. Um, and, and I know that this will pass tonight, um, but I feel like I have to, for the record, say that I have some reservations about the decisions that live in here um, and I do hope that we can work together as a council well before August to get a question that will be on the November ballot to voters to make sure that the, uh, the dates to qualify for, a, for a, um, an upcoming ballot are much more realistic so that we don't run into that problem. I know I'm being a little bit strict here with regard to qualifying for the ballot. I recognize that's not going to happen until August 14th this year, and people would like to get money before that. Um, so I appreciate where that where that's coming from, and I'd be happy to take the lead and make sure that we've got um, the work in front of us to put that on the ballot for the voters in November. Um, and again, we will take this up during budget time, so we'll we'll just need to make sure that we have that discussion in the full context of the decisions that we're making. Um, but I, for me, I just I, it it doesn't it doesn't feel like we're quite there yet. Okay, I think we're ready to go on, ahead and vote on Order 171 as amended. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? No. Councilor Zaro? No. Councilor Jabaro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? No. Order 171 passes five to three. Again, thank you everybody for your contributions and thoughtful deliberation. Give me a minute while I find my agenda. <laughs> Okay. Will the clerk please read order 176? <laughs> oh, take your time. <laughs> <laughs> Too many pieces of paper. All right. Order 176, appoint, uh, 2223, appointing members to various boards and commission, commissions sponsored by the Legislative and Nominating Committee. Mayor Kate Snyder, Chair. Uh, thank you. Is there any public comment on order 176? Go ahead. Hello, my name. Hello, my name is Matt Walker. Uh, I am one of the nominee, one of the four nominees for the. I'm on the nominated for the rent board seat, and uh, I really don't have any comments. I'm just here to say that I noticed that there was some comments made about me. So if you have questions about those, I'm happy to answer anything you want. Right, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Seeing no other public comment on Order 176, I'm going to close public comment and come back to the council for a motion, please. Move okay. passage. Second. Councillor Zara with a second from Councillor Fournier. Is there any council discussion? Um, Councillor Fournier. Thank you. Um, one of the things I just want to bring forward, and um, you know, I served on the police citizen review subcommittee. Um, we've all served, I think, in, in various capacities. And <clears throat> I think in our in our lives outside of our elected role or appointed role. We, we are humans who have opinions, who have beliefs, who have biases, 
um, and we'll say, you know, things that are on our mind. I will say things on my Instagram about what I'm mad about. Um, like when Nazis come to Portland, I get mad about that. Um, and so I don't think that makes me any less qualified to sit here and do the work of the council and be objective to read the ordinance language that's in front of us to listen to the deliberations of my colleagues um, and do the job that I was elected to do. And so while I appreciate the, the public comment that came forward and the concern, I also feel that as our um, committee members, you know, take their oath to fulfill that office, they're going to do that and we should trust them to do that until they give us cause not to. And I think the chair of any of these committees, as they have in the past, will come to the council and provide feedback if that's not happening or if someone is acting out of character. Um, so I feel comfortable with the slate that we've advanced when we've reviewed these candidates, we've interviewed them um, as a nominating committee, um, and I feel comfortable appointing them as we had them on a slate before, but um, I just wanted to mention that, you know, I do recognize some people might be controversial because of how outspoken they are in the community. Um, I appreciate those members. Um, but I do feel like as soon as we take that oath to fulfill what we were appointed to do, um, we're doing it um, as, as best as we can. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Other comments? I will say as the chair of the legislative and nominating committee, um, how important it is for community members to step forward and raise their hand and be willing to serve in these volunteer roles. So we appreciate that from everybody. Um, we continue to have a lot of vacancies on boards and commissions. And so we really encourage um, people to uh, step forward and, um, and take part in our city's government in this way. Um, we don't, you know, we, we don't always have a lot of people stepping forward. So it's our job, I think, as counselors um, and, and my job to make sure that we're, we're um, getting the word out there whenever we have a round of interviews coming up and really encourage people to, to engage. And uh, Councilor Fournier, as you said, once you, once you take that oath and you're in that role, you're performing a function on behalf of your community. And while we all come with our opinions and biases, we also kind of sometimes set aside some of our own personal um, agenda and and perform the work, you're in a role. Um, so there's always a clause for folks if they need to recuse themselves. Um, if there's reason to do so, there's always Corporation Counsel's Office to work with to understand that, um, that process, whether it's required or whether it's something that somebody would wanna contemplate. So um, uh, I'm happy to support this slate tonight and um, Thanks to all who have applied. Okay, let's go ahead and vote on Order 176. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 176 passes unanimously. Of those present, will the clerk please read Order 202? Order 202, 2223, approving modification one to the agreement between the Maine Department of Transportation and Portland regarding the Union Branch Trail Connector, sponsored by Daniel West, Interim City Manager. Thank you. I think uh, Bruce Hyman may still be on the meeting uh, and we'll speak to this item. Bruce is here. Thanks for being with us, Bruce. Do you wanna walk us through this? Yes, we'd uh, be pleased to. I'm gonna, I can basically just answer any questions if they are. I had to have some graphics if that would help explain some things that I can bring up on my screen. I uh, might be inclined to do that if that's all right with you. Yes, that's fine, thank you. So tonight I'm presenting uh, a modification to an agreement that was uh, signed by the uh, city manager last year after the council's adoption of the order, uh, basically to extend some trailway planning work that is uh, anticipated to continue for the next year as part of the, the land swap that the city council uh, executed last year with the main department of transportation to planning processes were put in motion as a result of that. Uh, basically, we got the Union Branch Rail Corridor from State Street to Park Avenue as part of that land swap. We got the money to design that pathway, which is an 80-20% split for the design piece, but we received 100% 
of construction funding that we anticipate to construct next year of approximately 2.8 million. That would leave a gap in our circumferential pathway network between approximately Park Avenue, Hadlock Field, and the Four River Parkway. So that second agreement that we signed last year uh, with the department allocated the preliminary planning for the pathway that would connect the dots uh, basically between uh, Park Avenue and the rail corridor in the Four River Parkway uh, trail that would complete that Bayside Trail extension, the Union Branch Pathway, then the Libby Town segment of that uh, Parkside to uh, Portland Transportation Center Four River Parkway Trail. Uh, last year's agreement was for $40,500 to get that uh, planning and design process started as part of the just adopted work plan by the Maine Department of Transportation. The project was uh, budget was increased to up to $250,000 from the $40,500 that was allocated previously, uh, that would increase our local match from the $8,100 for that $40,500 to up to $50,000 for that $250,000 planning and design process that would complete that uh, design process. We're still in the route uh, decision point. Uh, we'll be going to the Sustainability and Transportation Committee and the public in the next uh, couple of months to have put out our ideas in terms of how we're going to connect these red dots uh, with a pathway bikeway connection. Um, the CIP allocation for the local match was allocated uh, for the increase uh, up to that $50,000 was allocated as part of the FY24 CIP process in anticipation of getting these additional funds to complete the design. Uh, design process for this important gap in the in the pathway network. Happy to answer any questions or uh, at this Thank point you. in time, if there are any. Thank you, Bruce. We will, um, the council can come to you uh, with any questions that we've got, but first we will um, see if there's any public comment. Great. So is there any, um, let me see, any public comment on order 202? I do not see any in chambers or on Zoom, so I'll close public comment and come back to the council for a motion. Move passage. Second. Councilor Fournier with a second from Councilor Rodriguez. Council discussion. I don't see any. Bruce, thanks for hanging in here with us and for offering that explanation. It's pretty, so it's, it's explanatory and the materials in the backup um, are really helpful. Thank you for the work that you do. Um, and uh, we appreciate it. We'll go ahead and vote on order 202. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Zaro? Yes. Councilor Trevaro? Yes. Councilor Pelletier? Yes. Councilor Phillips? Yes. Mayor Snyder? Yes. Order 202 passes 8 0. And now I look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Councilor Fournier with a second from Councilor Rodriguez. We'll go ahead and vote. Councilor Fournier? Yes. Councilor Rodriguez? Yes. Councilor Dion? Yes. Councilor Zaro. Yes. Councilor Trevaro. Yes. Councilor Pelletier. Yes. Councilor Phillips. Yes. Mayor Snyder. Yes. This meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>